Welcome back to Uncork from Archaeology Now, where we raise our glass to the history, archaeology, and evolution of alcoholic beverages from around the world. I'm Stephen Batchik of the University of Toronto in Canada. And I'm Lucas Livingston, the creator and host of the Ancient Art Podcast and a board member of the Chicago Museum. In the last episode of Uncorked, we went on a pub crawl exploring the beers of Egypt and Mesopotamia. We learned that beer was the beverage of the masses, men and women rich or poor. Certainly, as we learned in earlier episodes, wine also flowed aplenty and was regarded as more of a, an elite beverage. But we don't see anything in Egypt or Mesopotamia like the all-out disdain for beer as we have in classical Greece. This episode is all about alcohol in the ancient Greek world. And the Greeks and the Romans were not unfamiliar with beer and its position in Greek society is somewhat debated, but it was chiefly characterized as a, a crude, barbaric drink, popular with foreigners and ostensibly prepared only as a last resort. The, uh, the first century BC Greek historian Diodorus Siculus, he tells us that beer was brewed only in lands where grapes wouldn't grow. That said, if you look far back enough and deep enough, there's plenty of evidence for beer production in Greece. Now, the Greek and Roman worlds were chiefly agrarian, agrarian societies, so they grew significant amounts of wheat and barley, and therefore had ready access to the cheap ingredients needed for making beer. Now, beer is infrequently discussed in the li surviving literary records, and it's been suggested that this is a deliberate snub of beer by the elites of the Greek world, and that the general plebs actually did drink beer. Although it really should be noted that beer is never mentioned in any of the playwrights of the time, and the playwrights of the Greek world were very much like Shakespeare, that they were writing their plays for the general populace, and so it's unlikely that they would that if the general populace drank beer, it would not come up in the plays. It could, however, reflect more of an urban rural pattern where people of the cities drank wine, but maybe the more rural villages drank beer. Overall, though, this whole discussion uh, probably reflects more a modern Northern uh, European bias. And in reality, all levels of Greek and Roman society drank wine. But obviously the quality varied. But beer did exist. And there were, of course, words for it. Brutos, usually referring to beers from Thracia or Fr Phrygia. Oh, and, and Zithos, which was the Egyptian style beer. And of course, there was uh, Krasinos Oinos, barley wine. Uh, which might represent a, a beer or perhaps even a beer wine mix. Now, I said beer is infrequently uh, discussed in surviving literary records, the key point being surviving records. One of the most important writers who talks about uh, beer in the Greek world is Athenaeus, and he actually cites 10 other uh, authors who discuss beer that have not survived uh, today. Uh, but overall, when beer is discussed, it's generally depicted as this is foreign and un-Greek beverage, and also sometimes as a medicine. That being said, though, when you look further back before the classical period, there is greater evidence for beer in the Hellenic world. It just sort of depends on your definition of beer. Before the classical Greeks, the Hellenic world was occupied by the Bronze Age Mycenaean Greeks and the enigmatic Minoans of the island of Crete, who probably were not of stock. Now the Mycenaeans clearly drank wine. In the Linear B tablets found in several palaces, they, do they document wine and, um, and vineyards as all playing an important economic role in the Mycenaean economy and society. The Minoans of Crete uh, also drank wine. Uh, significant evidence of uh, equipment for making uh, making wine and also, of course, drinking wine has been found in Minoan contexts on Crete and the Cycladic Islands. Uh, the Minoans were, of course, prodigious seafarers who traveled uh, to, and traded with Egypt, the Levant, and Anatolia. And if they had not discovered beer on their own, they undoubtedly were introduced to it by the Egyptians or the other groups in the Greater Near East. In fact, McGovern, Pat McGovern's work has shown that the Minoans seem to drink a grog mixture of barley beer, honey, mead, and resonated wine. This Greek grog was consumed out of mass-produced conical cups that are frequently found uh, in particularly in cultic contexts. 
Uh, this mixture um, remarkably parallels the beverage described, uh, uh, described in the Homeric poems known as Kikion, which the Mycenaean king Nestor drank from his Tepacentikepulon, or two-handed cup, and also by which Odysseus's men were enchanted by, by a Circe in the Odyssey. Kekion was described as a mixture of uh, Pramnian wine, beer, and honey, and apparently even with goat cheese grated on top of it. This mixture of beer and wine appears to have had a long history in the Near Eastern world. It's actually even found deposited some 900 years later in uh, Tunios MM, otherwise known as the Midas Mound at the, at the site of Gordian in central Anatolia. And it also played an important part in the Lucian mysteries in later Greek and Roman periods. In the 8th century BC kingdom of Phrygia, they drank a fermented grape, barley, and honey mixture. Now, while Phrygia wasn't Greece, it's located in modern-day central Turkey, the two did have strong cultural connections. And we learn that the ancient Greeks drank a, a strikingly similar beverage from close readings of the Iliad and the Odyssey, which were first transcribed right around the same time in the 8th century BC after centuries of oral tradition. And when we get to the Greek classical period, grape wine is king. So much of the preserved artistic and literary record speaks to that. A profound percentage of all those wonderfully painted ceramic vessels on display in museums once functioned in ancient Greek drinking parties. And these drinking parties, they served a, a similar role as old-fashioned gentlemen's clubs, where the upper crust male citizens would gather and socialize and conduct business while drinking wine, playing games, and being entertained by prostitutes. And the Greeks had a word for these drinking parties, the symposium. These days, we think of a symposium as a bunch of academics getting together, reading papers, and having a little wine and cheese afterwards. The ancient Greek symposium skipped the papers and went straight to the wine. Cheese was optional. The word symposium quite literally means a gathering of drinkers. Remember that next time you need an excuse for sneaking off to the pub. The Greeks did have their corner pubs too, known as the Capellion which were popular with the general masses. Just as we have tableware and drinkware serving very specific functions today, so too did all those lovely metal and ceramic vessels from Greece have their own specific purposes. The Hydria, as the name implies, is a dedicated water pitcher. The crater is a large, wide-mouthed vessel for blending water and wine. And that's a curious phenomenon in ancient Greece, that they blended water and wine. Greek wine wasn't necessarily any stronger than wine today. Rather, they diluted it to about the strength of beer. They considered anyone who drank wine straight to be a barbarian. That said, a Greek symposium often began with a small toast of undiluted wine to Dionysus as something of an homage to the dangers ahead. This cultural practice of diluting wine with water went back centuries in Greece and followed the early Greeks wherever they settled around the Mediterranean. A common type of drinking cup was the kylix a wide, shallow bowl with two handles and a short stem, a little reminiscent of the champagne coupe. I like to imagine the kylix was uh, favored towards the start of the symposium, when sobriety favored a steady hand. We also have deep drinking mugs like the cantharos and the riton. The riton is in a league of its own. This ancient vessel type in the shape of an animal's head was a, a cultural import from the Near East. Its popularity spread westward and eastward. We're gonna encounter the Riton again when we look at East Asia in a later episode. The Greeks enjoyed no shortage of humor with these drinking cups. The donkey was a somewhat popular animal form for Rita. That's the plural of Riton. Uh, when drinking from the donkey, the drinker seems to turn into an ass. A character in Aristophanes' play The Wasps quicks this supporting line, I brought this long-eared jar full of wine, how it brays when I bend back and bury its neck into my mouth. Uh, similar to this, many Kylix cups have large glaring eyes painted on the underside, so the drinker would seem to one's companions to put on an animalistic mask. 
This idea of transformation through intoxication into animalistic forms is an extremely popular theme in ancient Greek drinking culture. If you want to go down that rabbit hole, check out my article, Alcohol's Magic in Antiquity, Fermentation, Intoxication, Metamorphosis, and Madness. You'll find the link in the video description. Interestingly, some writa have small spouts at the bottom, often where the animal's mouth is, thereby making them ineffective as regular drinking mugs. So what's the deal? Well, there are two equally defensible explanations for fun and for faith. Just as in many religious traditions today, wine played a strong role in ancient Greek religious practice, notably in the form of libations. A libation is an offering or a sacrifice made through the pouring of a liquid, water, wine, milk, olive oil, or anything. A flat dish called a fiale was commonly used in ancient Greece for pouring libation offerings, but so too were these spouted rita not from the neck, but streaming through the mouth of the animal. In fact, the ancient Greek word raiton is believed to derive from rain, meaning to flow or to stream. There are a handful of Roman shrines from Pompeii and Herculaneum showing this sort of libation in action. The other explanation for fun, well, it's like a drinking game. It's hard not to imagine ancient drinkers pulling the spouted right on further and further away from one's mouth while trying to keep the stream flowing where it's supposed to. While it may just be a coincidence, we have the exact same drinking tradition today with the Spanish poron. So maybe, just maybe, the Greeks weren't so completely different from us today. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to check out our other episodes of Uncorked and more original video content from Archaeology Now. Click subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss out. We'll see you next time.